This is Kyron Barron. I don't know if I'm saying his name right. He's Irish. He's an Irish gymnast. You can tell that by what he's doing. Uh, and he was the only Irish gymnast that has ever competed in two Olympic Games. That's a pretty good accomplishment. But when you learn the backstory, it's a pretty incredible story of uh, dedication and focus. When he was 10 years old, he had a tumor removed from his leg. And it removed part of his quadriceps muscle, unfortunately. The surgery went wrong and it damaged some nerves. And he was in a lot of pain for a long time. And he was in a wheelchair for a year. But he was determined to be a gymnast. And so he worked and eventually got back into the gym. Only he had a bad fall resulting in a head injury that severely affected his balance and put him in a wheelchair again. And he was unable to train for three more years. The doctors didn't think he'd even walk again. But he did. He went back to the gym uh, when he could. In 2009, he ruptured his ACL, a major ligament in your knee that holds it together. And after 9 to 12 months, uh, that slowed him down a fair bit. He then ruptured the one in his left knee. But he kept following his dream. He competed in both the 2012 and 2016 Olympics. In the floor exercises in the 2016 Olympics, he dislocated his knee on the first tumbling run. And yet he still went on to finish his routine. Now, he didn't win a medal for that, but he did finish his course. Now, that is single-minded focus and dedication. Now, Jesus would, of course, have his people to be in the same way, single-minded and focused and dedicated to the purpose that he would have for us in our lives. And Jesus talks in Luke 11, 20 to 37, which we'll be looking at today. Jesus talks about the day when there'll be an ultimate fulfillment of him as the king. He talks about the kind of attitude we need to be, have to be ready for that day when he will be here as king. Just a little background. Jesus had just healed 10 men of leprosy in verses 11 to 19. And only one of them came back to thank Jesus and recognize him as the source of his healing. The kingdom, the rule of God, God working in people was showing up in this man's healing and in his therefore changed life. Now as the chapter continues into verse 20... Uh, the Pharisees return to the scene and they're pretty oblivious to God's working and they ask Jesus when God's kingdom will come. So verse 20 and 21. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. As Jesus answers the Pharisees, we see a couple problems um, in what they ask. First of all, they assume the kingdom of God is something that's in the future. It's not there yet. And Jesus says, hey, it's already here. It's already in the midst of you. Now, what's meant by the kingdom of God is that is God's rule over the earth. The people believed, the people in Israel in general, believed from the Old Testament that there would be a physical king subduing all Israel's enemies and leading the nation in freedom and prosperity. And the Old Testament does teach that such a thing will happen. But Jesus wants the Pharisees and the disciples to see that that God's rule means a lot more than just that. The Pharisees thought, because they didn't see a king at war getting rid of enemies, that God's kingdom hadn't happened. They had specific expectations, and if things didn't go how they expected... They couldn't see the reality of what was happening in front of them. But, but Jesus is telling them that it's already happening in things like the cleansing of those lepers. And in the hundreds of other people that he was healing as well. God's rule was seen also in throwing out, doing things like throwing out demons out of people who were enslaved by them. Early in Luke verse 11, chapter 11 verse 20, it says, But if by the finger of God I cast out demons... Then the kingdom of God has come upon you. And Jesus says, this is a sign of God's rule among you. Now, the Pharisees also believed that the kingdom of God would be exclusive to Israel. But as we saw earlier in this chapter with the ten lepers, that God extended his mercy even to someone like a Samaritan. It goes beyond Israel. To see God at work in his sovereign rule, the Pharisees needed to look beyond big national events to what God was doing in everyday people's lives through Jesus. Jesus' own disciples as well, they also had the same point of view. They had the same kingdom of God point of view that the Pharisees did. So he addresses them to help them understand God's timing of the kingdom. 
so that they will have the right single-minded purpose in their lives. Because things are not going to be quite what they were expecting. The days of the Son of Man, verses 22 to 24. And he said to the disciples, The days are coming when you will desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and you will not see it. And they will say to you, Look there, or look here. Do not go out and follow them. For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Jesus is telling his disciples that God's kingdom will not come like they're envisioning it. They will want to see the days of the Son of Man, but will not. Now, at this point, I better stop a little bit and uh, help you understand what this term Son of Man means. So you can understand what Jesus is saying when he uses that term. It's a term from Daniel chapter 7. And it refers to the king who will rule the world for God. It refers to the Messiah. Let's just look at that quickly. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. It says, I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away. And his kingdom is one that shall not be destroyed. Now that is some kind of kingdom. That's no earthly kingdom. And this is what the people of God, people were expecting. This is what they were hoping for. And this kingdom was given to one, as it says there in Daniel, one like a son of man. And this is a title that you're going to see Jesus use continually for himself. Whenever you hear him use that term, think of, this, of these verses in Daniel. Because that's what he's referring back to. And the people there would have known it. Jesus, the son of man, is the one who will eventually rule God's everlasting kingdom. And the people he spoke to, like I said, they would have understood that term son of man, meaning the Messiah. It's what all Israel was wanting and what all Israel was desiring. And Jesus said, you will not see it. And the people will try to con them that the Messiah is here. He'll be there. They'll say, hey, look, there he is. And he's saying, don't don't fall for it. But when, his king, when, when this kingdom happens, it will not be obscure. When Jesus does come as that king, it will not be obscure. It will be obvious for everybody to see. He said in verse 24 uh, in, in Luke 17, For as the lightning flashes and lights up the sky from one side to the other, so will the Son of Man be in his day. There we go. So just like the lightning is seen by everybody, the coming Son of Man will be seen by everybody, was his point. The glorious kingdom, the Son of Man, is the final phase of the kingdom of God. But he said it is not, but it is not yet. The God's kingdom awaits final fulfillment. Other things must happen before that final fulfillment. Jesus must die. Luke 17, 25. But first he must suffer many things and be rejected by this generation. He, he said, but first he must suffer many things. That he is the son of man. Go back in the context stated that in the verse before. Jesus is talking about himself. He's the one claiming to be the son of man who will rule with everlasting dominion. But Jesus must fulfill other Old Testament prophecy to fulfill God's plan. This is the role of the Messiah no one understood. No one understood that he was to die. But what Jesus had already tried to communicate to his followers back in Luke 9, 22, he said, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes. That's pretty much what he told them earlier there. And be killed and on the third day be raised. He's already told his disciples this. But they're not getting it. He tells them again. Jesus, even in that verse in 922, uses that title, Son of Man, to refer to the suffering aspects of being the Messiah. This was central to God's plan. As Jesus said, it must happen. He emphasizes that. But why? Why must it happen? Why must Jesus suffer, be killed, and be raised? Well, because human beings have a very big problem that can only be solved by Jesus' death and resurrection. You actually see the problem in our verses today, in the Pharisees and even in the disciples, because they are completely out of tune with God and God's plans and desires. They have no clue. 
God the creator who made people so that we could, he made people so that we could know him and we could love God personally. But the first man and the first woman, Adam and Eve, rebelled against God and they wanted to go their own way. And every person since then has done the same, including us. God says that such rebellion deserves death and that he will judge us individually for all the wrong things we have done and he will punish us accordingly. And of course, the weight of this guilt cannot be taken away by any amount of good works on our part because we can't get rid of the bad that's still there. We're still guilty and justice needs to be given to us by God. We're utterly hopeless to help ourselves. But God stepped in to help us. Even though we don't deserve it, God wants to give us grace. Grace is what we don't deserve. It's a type definition if you want of that. The very purpose of Jesus' coming was to bring God's kingdom to us, to bring his grace. Jesus suffered and died on the cross, taking the punishment for my sin and for your sin on himself so that God would not punish us. Jesus voluntarily took our punishment in our place. And then he rose from the dead so that we could also be given new life and rise from the dead and be with God forever in his eternal kingdom with Jesus, who is, of course, the son of man as the king. Our part is to simply turn from our sins, confess them, and trust, to confess them to God and trust, believe what Jesus did, paid for, paying for our sins, and we can be forgiven completely by God. Jesus wants us to have a single-minded purpose in life, living in obedience to God and waiting for his coming. So when the time is right, Jesus is going to return as that glorious king in Daniel 7. But meanwhile, the world will go on its merry way. Verses 26 and 27. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating and drinking and marrying and being given in marriage until the day when Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. People were doing the everyday things of life, not believing Noah about the imminent destruction. He obviously told them about it. Jesus says it will be exactly the same when he comes back. Verses 28 to 30. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus draws a similarity, a parallel between the days of Noah and the days when the time when he will return. Everybody's going to be going about as normal and Jesus will, will come suddenly like lightning. Now, everyday activities can be a diversion. They can be a distraction from being focused on the purpose of God. We have to do all the normal activities of life like he listed there. Eat, drink, buy, sell, plant, build. We do all these things. But the urgency, the reality that things are going to end and that Jesus will rule is to always be in our mind, even in the midst of doing those things and driving us as we interact with people around us. His coming should set our priorities in life, how we live, how we spend our time, even how we spend our money. For his followers, though, right then, they had to know Jesus would be rejected and die and would be raised and that as they carried on following him, they would also be a cost to that following. We need to serve Jesus whatever the cost, the verse 31 to 33. On that day, this is Jesus continuing to speak, on that day, let the one who is on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down and take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life will keep it. If this tells us anything, it tells us that Jesus' coming will be very sudden and will be very quick. And we need to be ready and have the right priorities. That's what the message he's trying to get across. The possessions of this life are obviously not the right priorities. If we have to, we leave them behind, both then and even now. Lot's wife, he gives us an example of someone who had misplaced priorities. We don't want to be like her. God had graciously removed Lot and his family from Sodom and Gomorrah before he destroyed those cities with fire. But Lot's wife didn't let go of what she had left behind her. She looked back, contrary to God's commandment to her and God's warning, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. 
And this warning is to give up is to us in this life that we need to, that we need to be willing to give up anything for Jesus, even our lives in place of what is most important, which is loving God first. And Jesus had already said this to his disciples. He had said pretty much the same thing back in Luke 9, 23 and 25 to 25. And he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses and forfeits himself? Only if our lives are built on God's rule, God's kingdom, will we have eternal life with God. This is not a time for business as usual in the lives of those of us who follow Jesus. The priorities of living under God's rule are to love God above everything else. And then to love those around us like we, should, we would love ourselves. And to do that in all of how life plays out. We will be ready for when Jesus comes if we're faithful in these things. Because when he comes, Jesus will separate his own from the condemned. Verse 34 to 37. I tell you, in that night, there will be two in one bed. One will be taken and the other left. There will be two women grinding together. One will be taken and the other left. And they said to him, where, Lord? And he said, where the corpse is, there the vultures will gather. What Jesus is saying here fits absolutely perfectly with the description of his coming in both Revelation 19 and in Matthew 25. In Revelation 19, Jesus is portrayed, he's, he's shown that he comes with the armies out of, out of heaven on, ho- on white horses. And he immediately, he destroys his enemies and calls the birds of prey to come and eat the enemies. In Matthew 25, Jesus tells how he will take all the people and separate his own people from those who are not his own. Matthew 25, 31 to 33 When the Son of Man comes in his glory, remember, again, when you hear that Son of Man, think of Daniel 7. This is him coming in his glory. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on the left. The coming of Jesus will be sudden and obvious to absolutely everybody. This separation that Jesus talks about in Luke 17, two in a bed and two working together, basically one will join Jesus and the other one will be left. But why will the people be separated? The next verse in uh, Matthew 25 tells us, verse 34. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. The kingdom. That's the whole explanation of Jesus in in, in Luke 17 is about. And when will it come? How will it come? Well, Jesus told them the fullness of the kingdom was not to come yet. And even we, we haven't seen it yet either. But when Jesus does come, his followers will see his full glorious kingdom and be welcomed into it by Jesus himself. But the others that Jesus separated, what's going to happen to them? These are those who have not turned from their sins and trusted Jesus for forgiveness. They've lived their lives for themselves. They did not love God. Verse 41 of Matthew 25. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Jesus didn't hide the reality of God's judgment on those who do not turn from their sin. He lovingly says it very plainly so that we can be warned, so that we can turn and find Jesus, so we can find life now. We can find life under God's present rule, under his kingdom, and find life eternally in God's eternal kingdom. Now, I don't like reading those kind of verses that tell about God's judgment and perhaps some of you are thinking, oh, that's just too black and white. That's too severe. That's, that's not even loving. But it is. It's God's loving warning. He's telling all of us that if we don't, and if we don't think our sin is that severe that God would do this, we're not getting God's holiness. That's how holy God is. And I'm, I'm just the messenger of God's word. And God's word uh, is asking us to, to consider 
the truth of what God is saying. So how is Jesus calling us to live now before the judgment time comes? He's calling us to be just like an athlete who has a single-minded purpose to perform with drive and with excellence. As followers of Jesus, we need to have that single-minded purpose as we live our lives and to have as our life priority eternal priorities, which are, of course, loving God first. That is our first priority. And then loving others as we would love ourselves. And that starts, of course, with our families and loving other believers and, of course, loving other people. And telling others about the hope we have in Jesus so that they can join us in eternity in that kingdom. Don't be distracted by the everyday things of life. Don't be distracted from what is most important. Be like the Apostle Paul. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. He said, One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let me read that one more time. One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. None of us are top athletes physically, but God is calling us to run this race flat out with all we have running toward him who called us and loved us more than we can ever imagine. Let's pray. Our Father, I thank you that your kingdom is coming, that the kingdom of the Son of Man, the kingdom of Jesus is coming. Help us to keep that in mind as we go through life, as we do the normal everyday things we need to do where we eat, we drink, we sleep, we work. But help us keep in mind eternal priorities and why are we doing these things and who are the people around us. Father, just apply by your spirit to each of our hearts what we need to hear, what we need to understand, what we need to change, what we need to do. So we thank you so much that Jesus came and that he died, he rose again, and that we can serve him. We can look forward to when he comes back and all will see him. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.